guys. We gotta clear the pool. You're the bodyguard, aren't you? A lot of bodyguards actually have come up and talked to me about it. You know, they, they, they felt like they were honored on some level. The job that they did was that they're not lackeys. If they are truly bodyguards, then they're willing to sacrifice their life to save yours, which is a deep concept to me anyway, because, I, I mean, me, I don't know if I could do it. I had been trying to become a screenwriter for a long time, but with little success, I couldn't even get an agent. But when I wrote The Bodyguard, it, it was different, and it, I was able to get an agent. And with that, I moved out to Los Angeles. And the agent who took me on was also very optimistic about it and thought, you know, he was going to sell it right away, but he couldn't sell it. And he was tenacious to his credit about taking it around for two years, and we were, it was rejected 67 times. This was uh, something that Larry Kasdan had written as a spec script when he was a copywriter uh, in 1975 for Steve McQueen and Diana Ross. And it hadn't got made, and it went through, uh, God knows how many, uh, how many is that, 12, 11, 12 screenplays written, written and rewritten by Larry. And during that time, my fortunes improved. I became a director. Kevin Costner, he had read The Bodyguard, and he said, I want to make this movie. Well, this was not a movie star who was saying this. This was just a young actor who I really liked. I said, well, you know, let's see what happens. And a couple years later, he was a huge star. And um, he never let go of the idea of, of making the script. I thought Larry was such a great writer, I asked if I could read it. And I read it, and and I just I so responded to him and his writing, and I and I just thought it was like weird that no one w would have made it. It was just so really good. The minute you read Bodyguard the first time, you understand why Kev would like it. I mean, that character of Frank Farmer, uh, from first act to the end, I felt like that's that made sense. How many times have you seen that movie? Uh, 62 times. 62 times? <laughs> Gosh. I've seen it a lot. The inspiration comes much from Kurosawa because of the spirit of a samurai, of a man who's not afraid of death. But the character and the way he would be an American bodyguard had a lot to do with what kind of person would take a salary and say that for this salary, which we have arrived at, I'm willing to die for you. And I wanted to write something like that. And it came pretty naturally to me to have it be a um, romance, too. Whatever dangerous endeavors those among us may take, we will die. The whole IQ of the character is established through the great writing. You know, I, I, I could have ruined that part by trying to, to do something really interesting with it. You know what I mean? It, that, that, that would have ruined Frank by giving him a limp or a lisp or a, or a thing, a tick. Will you grab that jacket for me, the red one, please? I'm here to keep you alive, not help you shop. Larry gave me great lines. I had funny lines, even being very controlled. I, was, I played every guy in the world at that moment, who was, at least had his wits about him and his resourcefulness, but he wasn't gonna let a woman walk over him, and yet he still had this huge problem of protecting this chick that was being an absolute bitch to him. I've been watching you all night from across the room. But he could see through her, so Larry wrote all those things. Why don't you go back there and keep watching? Kevin's attitude was there was nothing wrong with this story, and that we should just make the movie, and we talked a lot about revisions, which I was ready to do, but Kevin was very committed to the original script. It went through a lot of incarnations. You know, the, the script got darker, it got more and more violent. The Kennedy assassination, which is in Frank's backstory, went and became the, the Reagan assassination attempt, but it lacked the sweetness. So I said, you know, why don't you go back and essentially just do a few tweaks to this, but make this, this first thing. It has the kind of conviction of somebody writing a script that they believe in. 
And that's essentially the movie we made. Well, in hindsight, I think Kevin's clout to push some of these things was very important because um, it's never easy to, to piece films together. And The Bodyguard had been around a long, long time. And a lot of times when these things, you try to dust them off, it takes a while to get them going. It's harder than, than a fresh picture that's come in. This has sat in the vaults and, and to move it along quickly, Kevin, with the clout he had, it gets everybody moving. You know, I wanted Larry to direct it because Larry had written it. You know, but I think Larry and his mind had moved somewhere else, and Mick Jackson came in and did a really nice job. And he had come to the United States and made L.A. Story with Steve Martin, who I knew, and I thought that was a very entertaining movie and had a nice feel for the city. I got a call from Kevin Costner. I picked up the phone, and it was Kevin Costner. Huh. Saying, do you want to direct this large movie? And I said, uh, gulp, yes, please. All right, I'm up. Frank Farmer, Rachel Mayer. When I had written The Bodyguard Hello. 15 years earlier, I had made the character enormously talented, gifted, charismatic, and also a reputation for diff being difficult, for being temperamental, for being a perfectionist. And the original character is written that way. It's written for a diva, and there weren't many around that we really felt could, you know, play this part. And so Kevin said, I really love the idea of Whitney, and that was that. I got word that he wanted me to do this film and that he didn't want anybody else to do it beside me. That intrigued me. Why can't anybody else do this film? Well, we postponed the movie for a year because to wait for Whitney. There was an exotic quality to Whitney, you know? There was this thing about her, and, um, and, you know, guys are in love with her. Did you like that? Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. You look beautiful. We were obligated to screen test her. I didn't, I didn't feel like we needed to, but, you know, you know, giving her this role in this movie, I, I felt that she could. You know, there's not very many Whitney's come along. All of us were a little nervous because Whitney could come and fall on her face and in the studio, there it is on film. You can see it doesn't work. These are your lines? My main concern is, you know, I want to be believable. I want to be able to, to sink my teeth into this role and for people to say, oh, I believed her. She made me feel, you know, what she was feeling or I could identify with that, you know. Kevin was the one who was going to have to play all the scenes with her and he felt very strongly that he could do it. And the whole thing was just sort of gathered together to make it happen. A couple of weeks before we started shooting, she said, should I have acting lessons? And I said, no. That's the last thing you should do. That's two weeks of stuff you're gonna to have to unlearn before you go in front of the cameras. What you do have to do is remember that you're a singer and think of every scene that we're doing as being like a song. If there's an overriding emotion or something that the song is about, there's something the scene is about. And there's a lot of subtextual beats. So have you ever liked anybody? What do you mean? Like me, a girl. And there was the notion that if she was going to be in it, can we have the scene that explains the black and white thing? And I thought, absolutely not. It didn't really specify what her race was. She was just a big star. Her race was star, you know. It is not mentioned in the script that way, and that was not the plan. It was just a star and a bodyguard. Black act, white, white, black, you know, I don't, I don't think of it like that. I just think of it two people who have relationship, you know, and that's life. Race is not brought up as it shouldn't be. It was just these are these two humans and going through their lives and finding each other and and um, that worked beautifully for us. The chemistry helped us just blow right by that issue and I think to try to isolate it with a scene that would help explain it would have been a real mistake and so I didn't even want to risk creating a scene like that. good example of a certain kind of thing that we do in American movies where you know who the hero is, you know what kind of guy he is, and you're not surprised when the woman is attracted to him. And in this case, when I had written it, the idea was that the woman character would be just as strong as, as this quiet bodyguard who was protecting her, so that when they had their disagreements and then they're coming together, it meant something because they were both very formidable, you know, and we were able to pull that off. That's who Frank was, and to try to make him more would have been a mistake, and Larry's writing made him incredibly interesting to watch, and also, in a sense, made you 
If you're a woman, trust this man. And if you're a guy, wish that you would say things in the heat of battle the way Frank would say things. Kevin's character, Frank Farmer, is trying to do what he's, he's doing in the face of almost insuperable odds. He's trying to protect someone who knows no restraints in her personal behavior, who is out there. And so I tried to make the scenes where he's supposed to be guarding her in a public place very crowded and chaotic. Mostly, I think, for me, was seeing Kevin as Frank Farmer. When I saw his haircut and I saw his uh, suit, I thought, Kevin has understood this thing perfectly now, you know, for 12 or 15 years, you know, and he's going to do great with this. And that was, to me, the most satisfying part of the whole movie. So Kevin walks in the door, and he was white walls and had really trimmed it all off. But he walked in, and I'm like, what have you done? I cut it short on purpose for the way I wanted it to be, and I, I liked it for the part. I really liked it. Yeah, I got a lot of grief over Bodyguard from my haircut, and then for the last 15 years, everybody's worn their hair that way. Kevin is very generous in the movie. He gives Whitney every scene he can. He's never competing with her for the attention scene. He is Frank Farmer fully in that he wants to disappear. I've had that kind of protection around me, so I know what that's all about. And it's weird, and Rachel thinks it's weird, you know. Whitney thinks it's weird. Kevin pushed very hard on some scenes to say, I need to get more out of you, Whitney. And, and she would say, I'm there for you. So I think the two of them, they, they got along famously. I mean, they really did. It, it is one of those nice stories. was the strength of what Larry wrote between Frank and Rachel. <laughs> and of course we had a song that, that just really tied it all together in a way, but um, you can't just get a great song. And Bodyguard was very much about language. I think Rachel Maron is lonely in the crowd of all the people who swirl around her, all her press people and advisors and makeup people. In the middle of that is someone who's alone and recognizes a kind of strength and individuality in, in Frank. And I think that's, that's part of the bond that, that establishes between the two of them in the movie. She was a woman. She was nothing more than a woman, a talented, egotistical woman that was impossible to take your eyes off of. This was about two people who fall in love. And also there's a collision of two worlds. There's the watcher and the watched. Frank Farmer is the invisible man watching his client and actually not watching his client, but watching the crowds, not watching his client. Rachel and Frank are two different people who think differently about life. Somehow paths their paths get crossed and he's introduced to her world and she's introduced to his. Well, they're not very happy about either one. Kevin, I thought, played beautifully. Let you see that uncertainty, that desperation sometimes when the face is, is a mask of saying, I'm in control, I'm watchful, I'm guarding this person. But when things start to get a little crazy, you see some of that in the eyes. And I think when he starts to fall in love with Rachel, you see that, I think, beautifully understated. And uh, I love working with the two. I thought the chemistry between the two of them was great. Right from the beginning, uh, on my first handwritten draft, there's a lot of talk about the songs, uh, including the titles, some of which became song titles, like I Have Nothing. It's a, it was in the original handwritten script in 1975. Uh, the, the music in the movie, the songs in the movie, and the score in the movie have obviously a storytelling function, so the, the choice of subject matter for each song and the titles is... I'm sitting at the piano with a blank page. I have nothing to write about. I've got to like conjure up everything. But when somebody says to you, this is a love story between a man and a woman and, and he's a bodyguard and she's a singer and whatever the scenario is, um, it just, you know, that becomes your co-writer. So the movie becomes your co-writer. She 
was always a singer and a performer. And I thought that whoever we got should be able to do that. I was concerned that an actress could not do that and be convincing. When we wound up with an actual pop star, I was very relieved. And the fact that she then collaborated with, with David Foster. Whitney's like a racehorse. She steps up, she walks into the studio, she steps up to the mic, she takes her coat off, and she goes. If I should stay, I would only be in your way. The song that we were going to go with was a song called What Becomes of a Broken Heart. And I'm opening up Billboard magazine, which is the music Bible. And I'm looking at the charts, and this kid, Paul Young, enters the charts at 60 with a bullet with what becomes of the brokenhearted from some movie. So I call Kevin Costner right away. I said, Kevin, and I'm really thankful about this, but I didn't say that. I said, Kevin, we can't do this song. Paul Young is about to have a hit with it. I mean, it's going to be crazy. And he goes, oh, jeez. I'll think of you every step of Jim Wilson uh, came to me with a couple of songs, including uh, I Will Always Love You. And I had known that song and loved it. I hadn't listened, honestly, to a lot of Dolly Parton. Put the song on, and the minute you, you, you at least I heard not only the lyrics, I'll Always Love You was what this moment was about, but thought, boy, Whitney's rendering of this is as great as Dolly's was. I said, I know what Whitney can do now. I'd heard her sing a bit and said, she can knock this out of the park. The thing that I, I love about Kevin is that he loves to, he loves music, he loves to sing. He likes melodies, you know. Um, you don't have to be a great singer to love music or to even hum it. You know, Kevin's a good hummer. He sings all the time, you know. But um, I, I helped him with the, with the singing and he helps me with the acting. And then a little bit of the battle started. When Kevin said to me, you know, I'd like her to start the first part a cappella. I was like, come on, are you kidding me? I said, you know, and he said, no, I think it'd be great. I said, are you kidding me? You can't start a record that way and it won't get on the radio. Are you, it's not gonna work. I said, I'll tell you what, for the movie version, we'll do that. But when I make the record version, I'm gonna put music around it. He said, okay, well, whatever you wanna do for the record. But in my movie, she's gonna start a cappella. I wanted that for her character. And um, and Whitney had a big trust in me. And I she stands up there. And I'm standing beside her mother. And she goes, if I... And it's like, it was like the Max L ad. It was like the hair just like went, you know. It's the first time she had really sung it for real. We talked about it, but she'd never really done it for real. But the record company wasn't that happy. They weren't happy because they didn't think that that song would play on radio because of the, the, the slowness at, at the first. They go, this will never play on the radio. And I remember saying, I don't care. You know, so I really took that one on my shoulders, that song. Whitney was used to a lot of success, uh, so it wasn't that shocking to her. But the soundtrack, as huge as it was in the United States, it was twice as big overseas. So the overall gross for the movie was astounding. The Bodyguard was selling a million albums a week. Ching, ching. <laughs> and the first time I heard it on the radio, I heard it all day. It just didn't stop playing and it didn't stop playing for a long time. And I, I will always love you. I will always love you. When I was in England, there was an article in the, the Guardian newspaper about somebody who was sent to prison for playing I Will Always Love You over and over again, 24 hours a day, so loudly that the floorboard shook in the apartment next door and the person next door sued them and brought in a, a music psychologist who said, yes, that repeated four chord structure of I Will Always Love You does count as psychological torture. I don't think of it that way. I, I can't hear that without you know, hearing the movie, seeing the movie. Who's out there? Wait. 
they don't get together at the end. It's, it's almost like Casablanca. And that was very much in my mind in the scene at the, the airport at the end when she rushes off the plane into his arms. It's like Casablanca. It's like, we'll always have Paris. Except she doesn't say that. She could say, we'll always have the Oscars. It just left open the possibility that they would meet again someday. Well, in the original draft, it was clear they would never come back together. And when you're dealing with, though, with Kasdan, and I know Costner very well, it's not about, and it wasn't then, can we grow more ever? I mean, to these, both these guys, it clearly was story. What's the right story to tell? What is it that we want to say? Part of the lump in my throat was realizing what was going on behind the camera. To get that shot of Whitney running out, out of the plane, running over to Kevin, embracing him, kissing, and then the camera swirling around. In the days when you didn't use Steadicams very much, we had a dolly rail built and a railroad switch built into it, you know, like when a train's changing tracks. First time we did it, the momentum and the centrifugal force was so great for the camera operator as we swiveled around Whitney and, and Kevin. He fell off, but the camera kept running, and he ran and caught up with it and jumped back on again and kept operating until the end of the shot. And that's the shots in the movie. You never know. It was, a, it was a wonderful ending, and it was theatrical, but it wasn't over the top. And the, the, the precise thing for me was ending in the Kiwanis Club or whatever that thing was and people are eating, you know, chicken. And that was what Frank's life was going to be going forward. Because even though they are, they, they learn to, to love and respect each other and they become friends, their worlds just don't mix, you know, because at that point it, it wouldn't be a bodyguard and client situation. We would have to be lovers, you know, because it's gotten that hot and that intense, you know, so Frank can't deal with it, neither can Rachel, you know. More so Frank. Frank doesn't want to deal with it. Rachel, she don't care. He's like, I don't really care. Come on. <laughs> it's satisfying to see that this simple love story had a worldwide sort of acceptance. I went and had lunch with Quincy Jones at his house, <clears throat> who's another mentor of mine, during the making of The Music of the Bodyguard. I've been to Quincy Jones's house twice in my life. But right out of nowhere, he invited me over for lunch, just the two of us, right? And we're sitting there having lunch, and he's just so smart, this guy. He just intuitively knows things, you know? And he's just he's putting his salad up to his mouth, and he stops, he goes, you know, this is gonna be the most important music project you've done in your life and probably might ever do. It's like, really? Pass the ketchup. I think the, the, the main thing that touches me about the movie is that when I'm talking to a stewardess on an airplane, and she says, you know, what do you do, and what movies, and I say, the bodyguard, I get an extra big drink. That's great. And for a minute there, I didn't, think, I didn't think I'd make it. I thought, God, this is just so grueling. And, and the scheduling, I'm not a morning person. I, I hate getting up in the morning, you know. Don't talk to me till after 12. You know, I'm that kind of person. And uh, that was, that was, you know, discipline, you know, getting up and being there and the whole thing, you know. Um, just that I made it is the most rewarding experience from this movie, I think. <laughs> I'm really proud of that movie. I'm, I was proud to introduce Whitney into movies that way and show her that I was not only her friend, but that I was her colleague. I mean, I, I will always love her. Hey there, here's today's Daily Fact. Now, Waterworld, the critically panned Kevin Costner action movie, couldn't manage to stick to a budget of 100 million, thanks to difficult sets and major demands allegedly made by both cast and crew. In fact, the set itself, built in the middle of the ocean, instead of on a soundstage, was so difficult that everyone involved had to jet ski to it. In the end, the movie cost a staring 175 million to make. Mm. Now, remember, click here below to subscribe, or over here for more great content.